should be in the end, and we will be speaking about the very complicated topic that is what's the link between the cultural diplomacy, image of the country, and national security. So for that, we'll have the opportunity of the participants from different countries, and the moderator will be by the Director General of the Ukrainian Institute, Volodymyr Sheikor. I'm happily giving him the floor. Hello again, dear participants and listeners. Thank you, Irina. We are really have uh, achieved the last panel discussion today. And first of all, we'd like we wanted to open the forum with this topic because it's a huge topic which should create the framework for the further um, uh, discussions. But because of the difference in the time zones with the United States, we decided to finalize with this discussion. But it's very nice because we can sum up lots of the things which were mentioned above during the previous panel discussions, because the topics of the national security, cultural diplomacy and image were uh, sounding in a throughput fashion during all of the previous discussions. So now we can really think and reflect on the above mentioned topics. And I'm really happy that we have today incredible speakers from Ukraine and the US. And I'd like to tell a bit more about each of them. So, Eminet Jepar, first deputy foreign minister of Ukraine, who used to work as the first deputy minister of information policy of Ukraine and an advisor of the Ministry on Information Security in Crimea. She was the Radio Svoboda journalist and also she's the deputy of the chief and ed uh, editor in chief Crimea reality and also she was the hottest of the Crimean TV channel. She was working in the Department of the Humanitarian cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Alexander Litvinenko, Director of the National Institute for Strategic Studies, Doctor of Political Sciences and the Professor. He is together with us at the location close to me. He is also uh, used to be a deputy of the Secretary of the Council of National Security and Defense. In the National Institute of Strategic Studies, he's studying the issues of external and security policy of Ukraine, and his professional interests include the national security of Ukraine, Russia, external and security policy, and the research concerns political, economic, and social development of Ukraine, including the conditions of the hybrid warfare. And also, Alexander used to be my teacher last year at the School of the Strategic Architect of Kyiv Mahila Business School. So I'm really happily remembering that experience. I'm happy that Alexander with us is here. And also we've got Sergei Kislitzer, permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations. Before that, Sergei has been working as the Deputy Minister of Foreign, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. He was the Director of the Department of, International, uh, Department of International Organizations and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He took the diplomatic position in the United States, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, the mission of Ukraine to the NATO. He used to be the head of the National Commission on UNESCO Affairs, the member and the head of the delegation of Ukraine at the General Assembly of the UN, the General Conference of UNESCO, the Annual Council of the OSCE, and also in UNESCO. So, also we've got again remotely from the United States of America, Dr. Vivian Walker, Executive Director of the United States Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. Um, at the State Department of the U.S. Vivian has 26-year experience of the work at the State Department of the United States. Vivian is the teacher and the writer, the researcher, the scientific researcher of the uh, Center of Public Diplomacy of the Northern California University, and also she used to be an adjunct at the School of the Central European University. She has lots of publications on the topics of public diplomacy in the complicated information spaces, and also she reads lectures with those topics for different institutions, and also we have a nice professional connection with Vivian because she is an advisor and the lecturer in the project of the knowledge transfer on public diplomacy, which is implemented for several years in Ukraine with the support of the Embassy of the United States in Ukraine and the American Councils on International Education. So I'm really happy that we had an opportunity and experience to speak with Vivian today. So we have a very 
a diverse panel of participants today, so I'd like to begin, well, with no surprise, with the definitions, with some framework definitions which we could govern ourselves with. So, we were speaking a lot how public and cultural diplomacy help in the creation of the subjectivity of Ukraine at the international arena. And of course, this is an issue which is very diverse. Subjectivity is a really saturated or substantial notion with huge capacity, with lots of senses. So when we speak about security, the national security, it's not less or maybe even more bigger, it's a bigger capacity word. So, connecting cultural diplomacy to the national security, it's important to define what we're speaking about, which definitions we are managing. So, I'd like to begin with a question to Mr. Alexander, which concerns the recently approved strategy of the national security of Ukraine, which was approved in September by the presidential decree. So, in my opinion, as I'm not professional, we don't have that much attention there driven to the humanitarian issues, humanitarian aspects as the part of this vision of national security. So speaking about cultural diplomacy, which can be the factor of national security, I would like to get interested in the issue whether it was done with a certain intention, or we are just now in the different category and notions sphere. Is it correct to connect the issue of cultural diplomacy with the factors which can stand for the national security? First and foremost, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the Ukrainian Institute for the organization of this wonderful forum and for the invitation of me and for an opportunity to have a speech with an explanation of my own views onto this undoubtedly key topic. So, I'm sure that public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy as its component is incredibly important direction of activities in the modern world. Moreover, there is a very well-known phrase that culture is the fate, but I don't think that it is the fate. It's more of a, a certain restriction, a limit of the opportunities which define us how we are and the way of our further development. That is why the narrative about us, who we are, what we are striving for, what we love, what we stand for, are incredibly important in the modern world. In fact, cultural diplomacy is what's the difference of our country in comparison with all the others, what we are. Still, directly, it is connected with other components of diplomacy and with national security as it is. Simultaneously, I'd like to express my own opinion. I'm a big adversary of the notion of national security. It cannot be wholesome. In our story, the security was considered to be everything. And it was bad both for the security itself and also what's more important for the society. I am sure that there are certain notions which are even more important than security is, which tells us about the basic points, about the survival, about the independence, the state sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the integrity of our constitutional course and our democratic institutions. That is why let us give the Caesar the Caesars and the gods to the God. The cultural diplomacy is important. It's about us. It's about our place in the world. Security is also important, which have to interact. They have to be 
closely coordinated, they need to be united, but still, let us not expand security and let's make it not too vast. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. So, I'd like to have a follow-up question then for you. So now you're speaking about the national security as the certain infrastructure of institutions or the certain set of state functions which provide, in fact, the most basic needs, the needs of survival and existence, who have to be constructed by other state policies, and we don't need to mix up we don't need to have a separate security notion into the broader non-infrastructural dimension. I'm not saying security is broader than just infrastructure. Security is the certain direction of activity, is the certain function of the state, the basic function. Because if we don't provide security, the state won't be able to exist. Its primary function is security. But let us not expand this basic primary function onto everything. In Ukraine, it would be weird maybe for the international audience, but in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, the National Security and Defense Council considered the functioning of the housing stock. We had such points as well. It seems to me it's not that right to have such an approach, though the housing and the residents, how we live, what's our welfare, how the functioning of the living capacity is working is undoubtedly rather important. But it's not security. So we are coming to semantics more now, right? Because I do understand your position. I'd like to transfer it to Emine, please. And to hear your Emine opinion, how cultural and public diplomacy in the dimension of the external and foreign policy altogether can solve and achieve political aims for the Foreign Affairs Ministry, connecting with what Mr. Alexander has mentioned about the important notions which shouldn't be combined. So would you go on and follow up his opinion? Well, I don't promise that it will be just the continuation of the speech of the most respectful speaker, Mr. Litvinenko. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude for this event. I consider that the discourse which we have today, taking cultural and cult uh, public policy as the phenomenon for the institutions, is really the measurement to form the certain sustainability of the processes as the element of the national security. Well, really, to add to what was mentioned by Mr. Litvinenko, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has its own task to develop the strategy of the foreign political activity. We consider that this document is rather important as the component of the movement, of the vision, how to move, which challenges we face for the system of the external or foreign policy of Ukraine, which we need to work on as the elements of the cultural diplomacy or the broader component of the public diplomacy. I definitely emphasize that I consider the tasks which the foreign policy of Ukraine faces have to be developed by the cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy. And in fact, today we are moving more or less in this direction. We are facing several challenges which I'd like to emphasize upon in a nutshell well, I would define two main challenges. First of all, subjectivization, which could include territorial integrity and identity as it is, how we communicate ourselves, who we are as a society, what country we are, whether we are stable or not, which reforms we are conducting. All of that is the kind of the component of understanding of the country's identity, which is important to communicate, explaining ourselves for the external audience. And the next priority, which was mentioned by the President of Ukraine, 
who articulated, was, which was articulated by the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs, that is the economization, economization of the external and foreign policy, because the positive image directly impacts the level of the economic relationship, familiarity and readiness to invest into this or that brand. Whether we want it or not, we are still living in the world of brands, in the world of images. And the countries which acknowledged that there is value added to, I'd say, political and economic tasks for the public diplomacy, they invest a lot into the formation of reputational strategies, the strategies of public diplomacy, image strategies. For instance, the ones which I like, uh, those are uh, the Emirates and the Qatar strategies which capitalize the image component of their diplomacy. That's what I'd say, in particular in the economic dimension. We're also facing the task like this, but it would claim more of organizational measures. Where we are now at, today we've transformed the Department of the Public Diplomacy and Communications. In fact, we have the distribution into the sustainable operational communications that is here and now, that is the attempt to have the high quality communication about what's going on in the moment, in an instant. Then stale communications, the new practice we would, which we would like to develop in the Foreign Affairs Ministry, the work with analytics, with the monitoring of the information space of not only of Ukraine, but also the countries which are important for Ukraine in the context of the externally political relations. This is the response onto these or those challenges, the context responses, the researches which are implemented and will be implemented together with the Ukrainian Institute on the perception of Ukraine by other countries of the world. And that's rather important as for me to form this context communication. And this department has to be a kind of a strategic performer. Now we are developing through the strategic sessions several documents which have to become the vision of the Foreign Affairs Ministry in the public diplomacy, that is the strategy of public diplomacy for the period of four to five years and together with the experts rather in an inclusive way with the representatives of the state authorities we are trying to develop this vision together. The success formula in the public diplomacy consists of these uh, components. The vision, highly desirable, it should be strategic. The resource, both human resource and the capital. I mean the people who have competencies, in particular in the foreign affairs ministry system. We also are paying lots of attention to the work with the diplomats who are working in the public diplomacy because those are certain competences and skills which cannot be found or couldn't be found in the usual diplomats and definitely the systematic kind of work. That is when we form the action plan to implement the strategic document and it is annual. It is connected with other strategic documents in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs like the future strategy of the foreign political activity or other documents. And then it seems to me we can speak about the outcome. I will won't focus on the precise tasks and projects, but just I will tell a little bit what we implemented in the creation of the Ukrainian Institute. I consider that uh, we really deserve the political will that understanding that the cultural diplomacy is the separate important element of the foreign policy and its task. Those are the campaigns which we implemented, Justice for Image 17, uh, which was devoted to the fifth anniversary of the bringing down of the plane and also the global online campaigns, the Second World War campaign, Explore Ukraine Now, which researches Ukraine virtually online. This is our response onto the pandemic, the selfie with the flag and lots of others which aimed to increase the familiarity of Ukraine as it is. 
And in the fourth quarter of 2019, we managed to create and launch two information image com campaigns on the topics of energy security of Ukraine, Stop Nord Stream 2. We also went on with the campaign Correct UA, that is about the creation of the Latin uh, transliteration of the capital of Ukraine and other Ukrainian cities, according to uh, the results of which 63 airports in the world are using the proper transliteration of Ukrainian toponyms, including the foreign airlines, that is Air France, Wizz Air, Ryanair and Lufthansa, and also the media holdings like BBC, Financial Times, The Guardian's Association press and the others and the international organizations like the EU and the US Geographical Names Toponymics Council, UNESCO and others. So we also need to mention that we face really objective challenge that is the pandemics of the coronavirus which of course all of the measures of the public diplomacy had as a name. Out of the latest examples, I can list the elections to the executive authorities to UNESCO, which make impossible the physical measures, unfortunately. So we are transforming our emphasis onto the digital campaign and the creation of the certain campaign, the flash mob, which is initiated by the president of Ukraine, which will be devoted to the cultural heritage of Ukraine. As for me, it would be the totally cultural promotion element or the promotion of Ukraine to the executive council of UNESCO, which is the leading body of this organization. Or, for instance, the Crimean platform, which is also one of the rather loud topics which foresaw the list of physical public events in the, as the certain ecosystem, with the understanding that they cannot be conducted now, because among the speakers we have Mr. Serhii Kaslitsa, who initiated the public event, the discussion which was devoted to the resolution on human rights in the occupied Crimea and it's also the element of the promotion of this resolution and the involvement of the broader circle of people who support it like the sponsors or who support this foreign policy initiative of Ukraine. So as for the coronavirus I may say that in fact this is the main challenge to decrease the decrease of the financial resource, because it seems to me the public diplomacy, especially in the content world, in the world of the short attention span, when each country has to create such a high quality content, uh, the resource is rather important aspect, because the high quality content cannot be done for free. And in fact, we now a fight for the budget of the Foreign Affairs Ministry for the image task. We are convincing the MPs and the heads of the parties and committees that those, these works need certain budgeting. So I do hope we will be heard and the events we have planned in the Department of Public Diplomacy and together with the Ukrainian Institute and other stakeholders will help us to implement those tasks which the foreign ministry faces. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to deal with the thing which you mentioned above, the strategy of the external policy, which comes through the national security strategy, because there it was the first time where in such a strategic document with the basics of the, and the principles of the foreign policy, we could hear the cultural diplomacy as an important tool. So could you just spoil or tease us? What's the place of cultural diplomacy there? How did you formulate this range of tasks which are implemented by the Ukrainian Institute and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the foreign institutions abroad in this strategically important document? Well, I don't know how to create a spoiler. I will only tell that there will be certain attention to it. But this is the strategy of the foreign policy activity, not just of foreign policy, but foreign policy activity. And in fact, 
This is the element of the political and cultural diplomacy, and it's, as its component, it's already being implemented by the Foreign Affairs Ministry, so we need to provide certain understanding of its way of work. This is what we will be working on, developing the draft of the document. Thank you so much, Emine. Today at the forum we have already mentioned what progress we have achieved during those several years, and we've remembered previous four forums of cultural diplomacy and lots of people who were involved in this process before. So we were really gratefully remembering those efforts today. I just do remember my own training in the university, where in five years I never heard a single word about cultural diplomacy. And not that many time passed after that, but you can see that together with our common efforts we're bringing that to the level of the state policy. And also I'd like to give the ball now to the cultural diplomacy of certain political tasks, institutional tasks of the ministry and foreign diplomatic institutions. So let us bring this uh, ball through the Atlantic Ocean to Mr. Sergei Kislitsa. As one of the most experienced diplomats at the Ukrainian Diplomatic Service, so I'd like to ask Mr. Sergei now, how do you feel this help, or maybe you don't feel this help, of the cultural diplomacy and the cultural content in your daily work at the platform of the United Nations, and how this tool is working both for the bilateral level of the diplomatic relationship between the countries. So please, the floor is yours, and if you didn't turn on the mic, would you please turn it on for us to hear you? Good morning or good day, I do hope that you hear me. Yes? Okay. First of all, I'm really grateful for this forum, which, whether you believe it or not, I'm listening to you since 3 a.m. New York time, and it's really not that easy to understand the whole multi uh, many hours of the flow of information, and I already told my colleagues that I need to study some of the presentations separately again, and to study them again. On the one hand, it's really nice that this forum is broadcast openly, and lots of usual citizens and experts can listen to it. On the other hand, it occurs to me that we need to conduct a closed discussion to discuss several sensitive issues of our internal cuisine according to this forum results. So also it was mentioned that a very important thing is the notion, so the definition point. So about that I'd like to say that cultural diplomacy is not the same for me as the culture in the diplomacy as the tool to achieve in particular foreign policy aims, because to promote cultural product is itself rather important, but it does not mean that this promotion of the cultural product can serve the achievement of the foreign policy aims. Here we heard during the discussions the opinions and lots of information about the familiarity and the importance of familiarity of the country. And I already communicated with you, Volodymyr, that, in fact, the familiarity of Ukraine in the General Assembly of the UN is there. Unfortunately, the familiarity bears a certain toxic character, as for lots of countries in the world, the main feature of this familiarity is aggression, the military aggression, the military operations, occupation, the human rights violation, and so on. So that is why it's so important for me for this familiarity to be more positive, to become it more positive for Ukraine. I belong to the group of those diplomats in the United Nations who sincerely consider that there is the direct connection between the culture in the context of the human rights and security. 
I think, and for multiple times I raised this question, both in the hall of the General Assembly and the Security Council, that the circumstance that New York is not only physically cut from the human rights issues and culture, because the human rights since the 70s are in Geneva, and the culture is since the 50s in Paris, it brought to the situation that rather often the discussions about the human rights in the sphere of conflicts or prevention of conflicts are totally not considered in New York, in particular with the efforts of the China People's Republic or Russian Federation. And the conversations about the culture are sent to Europe. But you said that I was the head of the National Commission in UNESCO and I was the representative of Ukraine in the executive board. So you're in the executive board in UNESCO and you're beginning to speak about the rights of Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars at the occupied territories and you're told, no, 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 just wait, listen, we are speaking about culture here and you're beginning to speak about some complicated um, semi-military issues. Go to New York with that. And this is what we can see as a ping-pong here. I sincerely consider that the countries with highly developed culture and respect to the human rights won't become aggressors. So our task is to bring back the culture and the human rights issues to the our country. I have two more points I'd like to dwell upon. In the discussions, when we spoke about Global Soft Power Index, Steve Thompson said that, for instance, maybe it's worth to invest more of resources and efforts into the cultural expansion of Ukraine to the United States because the population is bigger and maybe we shouldn't pay that much attention to Indonesia. I don't think like that. Because as for those pragmatic aims which I face as the permanent representative of Ukraine to the UN, all of the countries are important to me because the General Assembly, the United States, have the same voice as Fiji or the Marshall Islands, you see? But the United States and Western Europe, for the needs of the discussion in the General Assembly Hall or in the Security Council, are already having the proper positions. So for me to drive some attention and of the smaller countries who have the same vote like Japan or Germany, I need to conduct cultural expansion and familiarity, positive familiarity of Ukraine in the smaller countries, in the countries and that the continents where still, objectively, we have the Ukrainian diplomacy present. And the last aspect. I am sure that Ukraine will be obliged, unfortunately, to follow the same way which all of the European countries had when we spoke about the economic development and economic growth. In particular, whatever is the increase in the improvement of social conditions and whatever is the increase of salaries in Ukraine will have to import working force. And to import working force we need to create in Ukraine favorable cultural environment which would respect the foreign cultures and traditions and we have a huge issue with that so I think that the part of the Ukrainian cultural diplomacy should be concentrated not only for the voting of General Assembly but for us to have the necessary growth economic growth and the countries of the third world where we unfortunately will have to import working force from. So the ways, those ways are not some specialized projects and separately taken projects in those countries. Those ways and an 
extensive resource is the education of the foreign students in the Ukrainian high education institutions. Because the education is not only to get some engineering or mathematics or political knowledge. Education and their stay in Ukraine during the education process could be that cultural shock or pleasant experience which people are taking all over the world after that. Unfortunately, it seems to me that during the last years, in spite of the efforts of the Ministry of Education, the education of the foreign students in Ukraine has become a commercial project, and the higher educational institutions pay more attention whether the fees are paid in a timely manner than the cultural work. And the last point, maybe the very last one. You know, in the Soviet Union, we had certain satellites and Bolshoi theater, Sputnik and Bolshoi. But the people wanted to give certain paper waste to change them for the books. I don't think this is the way for Ukraine, because security is not only guns and missiles and tanks. The security is also the housing conditions, the healthcare system. If we have healthy people who will have a nice place to live in, then we'll have the people who, if there is such a need to protect their country with the weapon, they will be healthy going to the front line. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sergei. I think that each of your words can be even developed into a separate discussion. And really, we will try to gather in a close discussion to this debate on that. But out of your points, it's that easy to formulate the next question to Vivian. Vivian, hello again. And uh, I would like to refer to what was mentioned by both Mr. Alexander in this connection of the cultural diplomacy to the national security and a bit of a narrower or maybe vice versa broader definition of security notion. Would you respond on to that and share your experience how it is working in the United States? How would you as the professional with so many years of experience would consider this issue in the narrower or broader terms? And the second point I would also like you to pay attention to, the words of Mr. Sergei about the cultural diplomacy versus culture in diplomacy. And those political, political tasks, which cultural and public diplomacy face and try to solve for the United States and the institutions of your country? Those are two vast questions, but please, would you try to answer them? And then we will go on to develop this topic. We'll have one more round of answers. But also, I'd like our listeners uh, to tell our listeners that you can ask your questions to any of the participants of this discussion in the comments under the stream live broadcast in Facebook. So please, would you do that? And in the end of the question, I will read out your questions. So Vivian, the floor is yours. Do not forget to turn on your mic as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope that you can hear me. And uh, if you can, then you'll know that it is uh, a real pleasure and an honor to be on uh, a part of this event. Uh, I've managed to listen to several of the panels uh, and um, what I hope to be able to do in my comments is to try to bring together some of the mainstreams of discussion as well as respond to, to your very specific questions. So in, in answer to the first question about whether culture is an essential element of national security, my answer is an unequivocal yes. And here's why. As we know from our study of soft power, National security and prosperity depend on an, a nation's ability to project its legitimacy in the global information space. Soft power, as we know, consists of popular perceptions of a state's culture. As Nye tells us, this is its identity and values, its policies and its relationships. But here's the problem. In the global media space, everyone 
has the potential to participate in the assessment and judgment of national legitimacy. And misperceptions or misunderstandings of a national image or behaviors represent a potential threat to national security. And we don't need to look too far to, to come up with an example of that. For well, Let's go back to two stories that appeared about Ukraine in mainstream media last week. Uh, the first story was about Ukraine walking back, uh, apparently, on a commitment to anti-corruption legislation a commitment that was part of the EU accession process. Another story was about how there appears to be popular support for the Russian Federation in eastern Ukraine. Now, for the public, without understanding the context, or to borrow a term from one of our earlier speakers, without having the necessary familiarity to include Ukraine's history, its national character, what it has experienced, a public might be inclined to see that the Ukrainian government might be corrupt and that an important segment of Ukraine's population is in sympathy with the very uh, government that is aggressing Ukraine's sovereignty. And what makes this more challenging is the credibility of these information sources. We're not talking about RT. We're not talking about Sputnik. No, these were credible sources and therefore underscore the apparent legitimacy of these reports. So this public might uh, understandably begin to wonder, why should we be supporting Ukraine in its efforts? Why should we partner with Ukraine? Now, this is a case where being familiar with Ukrainian culture and history could help to correct this con consequential misinterpretation of, of Ukraine and build public faith in Ukraine as a strategic partner. But, and here's my second point, cultural diplomacy is not merely a passive tool, a tool that enables interpretation or understanding. It has significant defensive capabilities. Just ask the Russians. What, you say? What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at Russian disinformation narratives uh, on you, about Ukraine, but we could also say the same for, oh, I don't know, disinformation attacks on the Republic of Georgia or on Estonia. What do Russian disinformation narratives go after primarily and significantly? Identity, values, culture. Why? Could we engage in a kind of a paradigm shift and think about the fact that at some level, Ukrainian identity and values and cultures might represent a threat to Russian legitimacy and its own sense of identity? And if we accept that premise, how might you turn those elements of Ukrainian culture and national character that threaten Russia into a defense of your national legitimacy? What do you have that Russia doesn't? Turning then to my third point and on looking at it from an institutional level rather than a conceptual question, I think we need another paradigm shift when, we, uh, when it comes to the role and inclusion of cultural diplomacy in an overall foreign policy apparatus. And here I'm not just talking about Ukraine uh, or the United States. I think in general, our respective foreign policy leaderships all think culture's wonderful. I mean, who doesn't like art exhibits or theater troops or hip hop artists? And culture is valued by and large at senior levels of the Department of State and the Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I, I think, for its long-term benefits. Investment in culture means uh, brings understanding, brings openness, brings transparency over time. But Generally speaking, leadership at these levels doesn't necessarily take culture seriously as a short-term national security asset. Culture is viewed more in a sort of a support function, an add-on, uh, sometimes an afterthought, perhaps more decorative than strategic. In the Department of State, now I'm talking about my, my own experience, our Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, which is responsible for the uh, education and cultural programs of the United States government, 
is extremely highly regarded, both internally by the US co Congress and to the extent that the US uh, population is aware of its activities by the US as well. But the, e the ECA, this bureau, is not integrated into high-level policy deliberations, either structurally or substantively. It supports policy, but it doesn't shape it. So I would make the case that given the role of the strategic importance of soft power and popular perceptions of national legitimacy, it is time to change things up. I think culture needs to be at the policy table. It needs to be part of strategic planning discussions, particularly when it comes to rolling out new policies or ideas or initiatives or messaging. It, it can help to frame uh, and create those conditions of familiarity that will ensure greater receptivity among the, with the public of these very initiatives and ideas and programs. Simon Anholt, uh, the, the other branding expert, uh, has said that there is only one superpower on this planet, and that superpower is public opinion. So I think it's time to activate cultural diplomacy assets to shape public perceptions in the service of national security priorities in the short term. So I think, uh, does that answer your question? Uh, well, yeah. Yes, Vivian, thank you so much. I think that you answered both my questions and a dozen of other questions which were already mentioned at the today's forum and those which we also discussed between ourselves during the day. Thank you so much for this position. I thank you for your bold position and rather acute position and rather reasonable one, especially valuable in this sense is your metaphorical appeal to the Russian-Ukrainian war as the war for the identity, for the history, for culture, or against the history and the culture. And if we fail thoroughly, we are attacked. First of all, what is the most danger, what is perceived to be the most danger? to those who are the attackers. So it seems to me that in this context, in the conversations about the cultural diplomacy, we need to remember that if really our culture, our history is attacked or erased or rewritten, then it is has a certain value. And it is a danger for another state project, which is incompatible with the state interests of Ukraine in this sense. So again and again, we are coming back to the connection of the culture and cultural diplomacy to the national security, to the security. I do understand that in the broader notion, what Mr. Alexander said in the beginning, but still, I need to give him the floor for several words, because he really had uh, very interesting response listening to Sergei and Vivian. Would you, Alexander, comment what you think should be commented upon? And again and again, I sincerely grateful to the Ukrainian Institute for such an opportunity and for such bright discussion. Incredibly interesting one. And I will express my opinion, my point of view. I can't help agreeing with the importance of this soft power and in the end of the day the soft power defines the conditions where the hard power is acting the culture is forms the environment where all of us are functioning undoubtedly the war and the confrontation with Russia, the war with Russia, is the conflict which is based upon the conflict of identities, as any post-empire conflict which is created and aims for the liberation from the previous metropoly. I'd like to emphasize the only thing now. Let us look at the issues of cultural diplomacy in a broader way than just the national security, which will be the protective one, which will protect certain interests. Vice versa, we should show 
like what we are and who we are. What's the basics of our identity? What's the foundation and what's our attraction? Without coming away from Russia, it is obvious this is the ta stage. Ukraine is not Russia, and I think we passed it. Let us just show what we are valuable with for the world. What's our message? And we need something to say for this world. And it's more important than and broader than the issue of tanks. This is the first issue. Secondly, as for the human rights, the human rights is the basics to provide freedoms and rights of the human being is the foundation of our constitutional condition. This is the safety, the safety of each citizen to provide his or her freedoms and rights. This is the task of our state to provide freedom and rights, human rights, to the people who have become victims of the aggression of Russian Federation in the Crimea and at Donbass. The human rights which are totally violated, both personal and national. But please, let us not bring everything to the security only. Cultural diplomacy is broader. Let us just leave security to the security experts, because when we bring everything to the security, we just lose its subst substance as the part. But overall, I totally agree with the necessity of soft power and the necessity of the protection of our freedoms. But please, let us speak not only about the protection in the context of the cultural diplomacy, but about the promotion, about our cultural expansion, whatever it may sound weird for several people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alexander. Well, in fact, I remembered the words of the previous ambassador of the European Union to Ukraine, Human Mangarelli, who said in the conversation that Ukraine needs to stop frame itself through the lens of Russia, through the prism of Russia, in any cultural communications or diplomacy. We shouldn't push away from the opposite only. I do agree with you that Ukraine shouldn't be only protective to stand for the basics, but it needs to speak and to have certain not only positive and praising messages, but positive and relevant messages which have information, not only protective or negative messages. And in this context, I'd like to drive your attention to the issue which seems to me rather acute now for the Ukrainian state policies. This is the lack of one voice policy, of the unified voice, because how Ukraine is communicating about itself abroad, in particular with the help of the culture, we don't have this one voice. We have multiple diverse voices of different actors, uh, which are interstate actors, let alone independent sector or any other subjects of this process. And of course, it's a nice thing. We cannot make everybody uh, similar, but on the other hand, it projects different images of Ukraine, which sometimes contradict each other, both at the value and aesthetical levels, at the level of key messages which Ukraine wants to communicate about itself. So here I'd like to ask Emine, how do you consider this one voice in comparison with this diversity of multiple voices? How can it exist in Ukraine, in fact? Do we need it, in fact? This is the question for the debates. The floor is yours. I will to comment upon several previous topics which I consider important what I heard. I totally agree that the cultural diplomacy and the broader context of public diplomacy need to have not only the paradigm of the national security. This is really the issue of total defense. This is the security of the broad context of perception and historical context and the historical context of identity and modern societal political processes we are overcoming. So it's not the secret if we ask, I'd say, 
the people who dealt with the research of Ukraine and its communications, I had some feedback from some experts, and I was told that out of the country of famine, you were transformed into the country of Russian aggression. So our communication, I mean the foreign ministry, Foreign Affairs Ministry before the 2014, during the presidency of Viktor Yushchenko, was about Holodomor, that is famine, and now this is the Russian aggression and occupation. Of course, we need to do that as well. We need to go on with that, but the context is important about that. It seems to me that a very proper context communication has taken place about the Crimea when we've implemented the anniversary not of just occupation or not of just mentioning of occupation as a certain fact which we are fighting against as a society, but when we implemented the day of the resistance against Russian occupation. This is not the occupation from the position of uh, the implications, but from the position that we have this resistance, and it really exists. And this is the strong position, strong communication. The same happens here. It seems to me that it's important to bring the country into the context that we, in spite of the external aggression, we have to conduct the whole queue of external and internal reforms, the educational, the health care, the decentralization, the land reform. So we need to change the context a bit. For that, we need what was mentioned by you, Volodymyr. We need that one voice, because the foreign ministry is not the expert in all of the issues, including the reforms. So one voice is necessary for that, for this communication to be sustainable, systematic and efficient, efficient from the perspective of the vast audiences for those narratives which are totally approved by the experts. I mean strategic communications of the state and how the state communicates in particular in the reforms. So it seems to me we've got huge issues with that. And I explain that for myself that the European experience witnesses. The efficient strategic communications are mostly inherent to the conscious, mature societies, if you want. The society which has a bit of a different culture of relationship corporate relationship if we take the state as a corporation in this context, the relationship between the actors, the ability to work together, not just individually. And it seems to me that we are just gaining those practices as the state, as the society, because we have a very nice civil society formed, the practice of inclusiveness of the civil society, including communications of different ways. And I do hope that finally we will achieve through this mix of processes, we'll get to the new practice, which will foresee the efficient one voice, including, because at the level of the government, we had several attempts to form this one voice, and it faced several issues, including competition for the communication of this or that sphere, because under the conditions of the reforms which has been conducted in the state, when the ministers are politically appointed, Every minister understanding that his public is his certain protection will protect his or her communication, but it impacts that one voice. And we need the balance between the political PR and the stable communications, reforms, explanations, what that is, not only to the society, but also international partners, why it's that important because several organizations, several states uh, invest a lot into the anti-corruption reforms. And it's logical that those players, those partners, have a certain understanding what and how is taking place and which implications it leads to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eminem. And when you began your answer, we could see that we had the question from the listeners, which really is close to your answer. 
Do you agree that somebody has to coordinate the cultural diplomacy projects, all of the cultural educational projects done by the volunteers and state and the public organizations on the territory of other countries? So the information support consultations as for the formalities and all the rest. It seems to me that partially it is about the one voice we just mentioned. Partially it is about the maturity of the institutions, both of the public and civil society. As for the conversations with the same topics abroad, it seems to me it's not that realistic to have, you know, one coordination political center which would deal with everyone instantly. But maybe, Emine, would you answer very shortly, in a minute, would you comment about that? Do you agree with that or not? Well, it seems to me the classical story is here, the necessity to create the communication platform. Why we need it for the better coordination of the work of different participants of the process. I do not believe in those Soviet approaches that we need some uh, strict and stable vertical where on top of this vertical there is someone powerful and stable a knowing person who has to define to all of the players where to run to, where to rush to, and the vector. I don't believe in those formats. We are substantially changing not only the world perception, but the practice of communication between ourselves in the collectives, in the state, in the society. And this practice is about the horizontal, but the horizontal which should be inclusive. Now it's a bit of chaotic, because we have a certain attempt to develop the horizontal, it's a bit chaotic, but still it seems to me that the communication platforms for the better coordination is what we really lack now. Thank you so much, Emine. And we've got really just two to three minutes left, because we will be just, unfortunately, don't have enough more time for a stream, so I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Sergei and to Dr. Vivian. So would you please be very precise with your answers, Mr. Sergei? As for the sense of the cultural representation of Ukraine abroad, we were speaking about the victimization, the position of the state which is complaining all the time and makes its problems visible. Maybe believing or hoping for the international community to take attention, to drive attention and to help to solve them. Does this position has the right for existence or is it harming Ukraine? Thank you. Well, you know, everywhere should be silver lining. There should be the healthy common sense balance between the necessity uh, to stand for our priorities and respect for the mentality and the right of other interlocutors for the healthy discussion. If you take, and I already mentioned those uh, s uh, examples, the speech of Putin in the General Assembly, the speech of Lavrov in the General Assembly, and you read them, those are super positive speeches. But people love to listen to that, because people lose, especially in the West, maybe Vivian will support me or maybe not, but people lose interest to the negative narrative just during the second minute of this speech. So we need to find positive narrative without doubting and challenging our strategic and national interest. The last point I'd like to mention, as this is my last opportunity to speak now, as the cultural diplomacy and the culture in diplomacy is a very highly technological issue. We cannot be just um, a well-brought-up person, and that's it. You know how it's written in Onegin in Pushkin. Thanks God, we cannot show our upbringing. We're not speaking about uh, speaking about the upbringing. We're speaking about our cultural diplomats. They need to have a special education. And I heard you that during the years of your faculty. Uh, training, you never heard about cultural diplomacy. The same happened to me. When I had my training at the international law, I never heard about cultural diplomacy. Sergei, thank you so much. I can only agree with you a thousand times. And the last 
floor goes to Vivian. I would like to ask you, out of your experience of interaction with Ukraine, with Ukrainian institutions, the work with lots of us through your projects, what lacks in this work today? What we should drive the biggest attention of ours developing the cultural and public diplomacy in Ukraine? What's your view of our friend? And we'd like to hear your friendly advice. Actually, I'd like to uh, respond to that by going back to a couple of the points that were raised in the Q&A, um, but prefacing my comments by saying that I see no lacks, only possibilities and potential. But a couple of the issues that were raised uh, in the, in the Q&A um, do reflect some some weaknesses that can be addressed. Uh, I completely agree with uh, the, the, the point that we need to stop, that Ukraine needs to stop framing your, itself in the lens of Russia. But here's the problem. That's the frame right now with which the rest of the world sees you. So the challenge is how do you do that frame? How do you destroy that particular lens and create a new one? Uh, I think that's a, that, that's a, a credible challenge. To go to the point about um, the one voice policy versus the, the multiple voices, I think, frankly, you need both. The one voice policy, as I understood it, was uh, an attempt to try to bring cohesion and unity and credibility and legitimacy to Ukraine's messaging, particularly uh, in the aftermath of, of, of Crimea and uh, in the midst of the very intensive war on Ukraine in the information space. There were gaps in the messaging. There, was, there, there appeared to be a lack of cohesion. And the one voice policy, I think, did a tremendous amount to get Ukraine's story told to the world in a credible way. But the one voice policy is, is, is not sufficient. You need the multiple voices. And not only do you need multiple voices, you need to be able to empower those voices. You need to empower your ambassadors, your representatives overseas, your NGOs. You need them to empower, you need to empower them to tell Ukraine's story in a way and in terms that are appropriate to their own experience as well as to the context uh, in which they find themselves. And of course, what you, in empowering all, your, all of your potential spokespersons, all of your cultural representatives, you are empowering individuals who are, uh, I hope, already immersed in and understand the context to which they are messaging, which goes back to our original point about if you understand what uh, uh, audiences' ingoing perceptions are about you, then you do a much better job of trying to, to, sh to shape and influence them. So uh, break the lens, create a new frame, and bring one voice in, but empower multiple voices, and uh, Ukraine will take its rightful place in the global imagination. Vivian, thank you so much for such an inspiring final words of this panel. I'd like to thank all of the participants of this panel. And I'd like to say that, in fact, the strong side of this discussion was really the multiple character voices, because we managed to gather different perspectives um, and points of view and experience during this rather short day as it I found out. Thank you so much. We will definitely go on with those conversations because it's worth it.